It's now time for the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. The Mike Wagner Show can be heard on Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, YouTube, iTunes, Anchor FM, Radio Public, and the MikeWagnerShow.com. Mike brings you great guests and interesting people from all across the globe. So sit back, relax, and enjoy another great episode of the Mike Wagner Show. Hey everybody, it's Mike from the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today, 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show, get 10% off your first order. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, the Mike Wagner Show can be heard on the MikeWagnerShow.com. You can check our Facebook page at Facebook.com slash the Mike Wagner Show. You can download and listen on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Also on Anchor FM, Radio Public, iTunes, Google Play, and Apple. Also, Mike Wagner Show is, is uh, going to be on Stitcher as well, too, along with uh, Shopbox, Overcast, and more. Also, coming to Podcast Addict, Deezer, and more. Also, take the Mike Wagner Show with you on any mobile device. Subscribe to the Mike Wagner Show on the YouTube channel. We're here with a wonderful singer and guitarist from Macon, Georgia. He has a very neat beginning, and um, he also has a very interesting history and how he got to where he's at today. A lot of uh, musical influences. Um, he's a music ambassador for his hometown in Macon, Georgia, influenced by many, many guitarists. He can tell you about it. And we'll also play some singles as well, too. And now that he's a singer, songwriter, and guitarist, he is also his own producer, also a teacher and professor, and also features a special day we'll talk about. And live, ladies and gentlemen, from beautiful Macon, Georgia, this guy is ready to rock. Here we are, Joey Stuckey. Joey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Mike. I really appreciate it. Hey, no problem. Joey's your singer, songwriter, guitarist on Macon, Georgia, and you've been uh, doing this since, um, you've been doing it for a while, and um, you also have been... um, a very unique beginning, if you want to uh, tell us about that and how you got this very unique vision that you have in terms of playing and everything else. You've got um, some singles out called Blind Man Driving, Six String Soldier, Trouble Comes in Threes, and uh, you're also a teacher and professor as well, too. And before we get into all that, uh, tell us how I got started. Yeah, so, well, it, it's it's interesting. People people talk to me a lot Um I do a lot of master classes and travel all over the world and, and talk about music business, music technology, um, some other things like the art of improvisation. And I also do a lot of inspirational talks as well uh, because I'm a blind brain tumor survivor. So um, when I was you know, really young, probably uh, a little little over a year old, my mom thought that something wasn't quite you know, right with me that uh, I didn't seem to be you know tracking her as well. I didn't seem to be navigating uh, my surroundings as well as she felt like I should. Um, and um, so she took me to the doctor and like, oh, gee, he's fine. You know, go home, bake cookies. You're just overprotective mother. Um, and, but, you know, parents, you know, parents know, parents know their kids and, and you know, what should be going on. So um, my dad had, uh, had had me by the hand and let go of me um, for, oh, I don't know, two or three seconds. And I, I just literally took a step forward and fell down like a flight of 30 stairs. Ooh. And um, yeah, it, it was, <laughs> my parents were, you know, horrified. And, um, and so um, they took me to the hospital. Of course, they ran me to the ER and they're like, oh man, I think this kid's blind. Oh my and goodness. so, uh, there, so what happened was, and, um, and, and it, it's, you know, to, to be fair, it's, it's really, it's nobody's fault. I mean, all, my only point in, in saying uh, about the earlier part is that you know parents know their children if you if you've got a loved one that you know and that you spend a lot of time with um you know you should always trust your instincts um about about health you know health challenges and stuff um and so my parents you know stuck to their guns and know there's something wrong with my child and and so um they determined that i had a brain tumor and the kind of tumor i had is pretty rare um it's uh, what was happening essentially was that it was growing so fast that it was basically um, destroying wiring from the inside out. So it was sort of it was sort of a, a, an explosion, if you will. Um, the tumor was moving so fast, so it it uh, 
cut, you know, severed all my optic nerves, which is why the outside of my eyes are fine. They just don't connect anything. Um, and so, and then, uh, that also, um, took my sense of smell. Uh, so, um, but Mike, I believe in using what you got. So, uh, I, I tricked my wife into marriage by telling her that no matter what happened, she'd always look and smell perfect to me. And that- <laughs> <laughs> That's a you good know, way to put it. It's like, I you mean, know, you know fight married was- people out there. You smell perfect yeah. no matter what. <laughs> use what you got. Use what you got. So, uh, in fact, that's one of my talks is actually, I did a lot of endorsement deals with, uh, music companies and one of my, one of my talks is how to leverage what you've got to get what you need so i just i just you know use whatever you got so my wife said that sounds like a pretty good deal so we, we've been married uh, 16 years now so um but the um the thing was it also took a lot of other it, it damaged my endocrine system so i have no thyroid i have no adrenal glands um i don't have so i don't have so i'm not a sick person but i am someone that their body doesn't do a lot of things that it's supposed to do so i have to very carefully protect my time, my energy, and I have to watch it. And I take a lot of replacement medicines that try to simulate the glandular you know, functions that I don't have. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I spent a lot of time as a, as a child. I uh, spent a lot, an enormous amount of time in the hospital. Um, the doctors told my parents, look, we've got to do surgery on, on your son, but – uh, if we, you know, the, the fact is, if we don't do the surgery, we know he's going to die. If we do the surgery, he's still probably going to die. And if he does make it, uh, he he won't walk or talk. Um, so we 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 you know we beat all those odds. Um, and so now, you know, thirty something years later, I'm still here. I am still doing doing what I do. And and the reason I mention it is because um, life has not always been easy, um, but I have always been able to make it work. And I've always been able to, by and large, um, do what it, what it was that I wanted to do. And music, music is really not a career for me. It is uh, more of a compulsion. It's more of a, um, it, it's it's more of a necessity, really. I mean, there's really no other way to say it. It's an obsession. I think it's a healthy one, um, but it's 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 something that I have to do. If I could choose to do something, because music business is really. It's a really strange business. It, 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 it really doesn't have much of a middle class. You're either <clears throat> broken at the bottom or rich and at the top. Um, or, you know, and, and there's such a high rate of delusion of, of, of people with unrealistic goals and, and people that, uh, you know, they, they want, the, they want the, uh, the fun part of music, but they don't want to put in the work. And, um, you know, people are like, oh, this, though, I have people say to me all the time, oh, well, this, this guy, I'm really a big fan. They were overnight sensation. I said, no, 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 no. There's no such thing as overnight sensation. You didn't know about them, mm-hmm. but that's an overnight sensation that's been 20 years in the making. So it's like, you know, it's like, you know, I, I, you know uh, music's just a very tough um, business. And with the way our technology is changing all the time, um, you know, it, it's, it's, that's a, it's a very good thing because there are fewer gatekeepers, but there's also a lot harder to get noticed as an independent musician. So it's something you have to really spend a lot of time on. You have to seriously be dedicated to it. And, and I tell my students, look, if you hurt, if, if, if not making music hurts you so much, like they, they, you're just miserable without it, then welcome to the field and we're glad to have you. If you don't feel that way, this may not be the career for you because you're going to need that true passion for it to insulate you from the sheer amount of crazy that that comes with being in the music (laughs) business. So, you know, and and I I don't mean that. I I mean that as a hopeful way. I mean, I'm I'm just saying to my students, like, look, guys, you know, you can have anything you want. If you come to me and say, I want to sell out 80,000 seat arenas. I say dream big. I'm I'm okay with that. What what's not going to work out for you is to say I've written my first song today and tomorrow I'm a star. There's there's a lot that goes in between those two things mm-hmm. happening. So you know, but um, anyway, I love music so much and it 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 called me. I mean it it is it is a calling, um, and it is it is uh, something like I said that I do because I feel like I I have to. And I'll tell you something. Music is a very powerful. It's the most powerful force that I know for positive change. And the thing about musicians or, or, or any, any artist, really, but music, of course, being the thing that's, you know, I don't really, paintings don't really do that much for me. Uh, so, so, you know, um, and, you know, they don't, they, they don't like it when you grope Mona Lisa. You know what I mean? So you go to the Louvre, the blind guy comes and to touch Mona Lisa. That's, that's just going to get you on some sort of list. Uh, but anyway, um, so, but I, I just really believe that, you know, 
uh, the, the power of music to, 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 to change hearts and minds and to inspire and to comfort. Um, and any art, really, uh, we, we act as historians, artists act as historians, reminding us of you know, successes and failures. Um, we act as new pathways to new understandings. We're able to bring new ideas and new concepts into people's lives and hopefully make that for the better. If you look at the kind of music that came out during the civil rights movement, uh, during the Vietnam War port protests, um, I mean, a lot of very powerful music that was able to change the mind of, of nations. Uh, I mean, happened during those times. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's always been like that. If you look at music from World War II, uh, especially with, uh, you know, for example, you know, our, our British cousins across the pond, there was a lot of very powerful music there that helped those people stay positive and, and focus on, on joy and not the terror of, hey, I hope we don't get bombed tonight. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, anyway, anyway, it's, it's, it's a very, it's, it's, Music is, in my heart and mind, like the closest thing that you know, we mortals will ever know to sort of the language you know, of the angels. I mean, it is, it is it's, it's an amazing thing. So um, I didn't really start taking them. Early, my early years, honestly, were focused primarily on survival. Um, after the brain tumor surgery, I spent about four months in the hospital. Um, and um, you know, just my early years were just really focused on survival. But um, I... One summer, I got sick with pneumonia. Uh, had to stay home like the whole summer, Ooh. and um, just like stay in the house. And I was just miserable. And they they gave me some medicine that cleared up pneumonia, but um, unfortunately had the side effect of me starting to throw up blood, which is not oh. the way one wants to spend a couple months, really. Um, so, um, but I, I discovered old time radio. Now, um, you know, here in the United States, people have kind of forgotten about the old time radio shows, which is basically like TV. And it's just mm-hmm. a picture. It's, right. Everything's, everything's told through uh, sound effects, dialogue and music, but you know, in like Canada, UK, places like that, radio shows are still, you know, like the real things. And I, and I adore them. But as I heard those as a 13 year old child, like the old Lone Ranger shows, of, uh, the shadow and all this stuff, I was so inspired by that, um, that I was like, man, that's, I can do this. I can do that. I can be a sound man. I can record, I can make sound effects for film and TV. And so I started buying some really cheap equipment and just started basically, uh, what happens if I plug it in? What happens if I plug this in? Uh, what happens if I do that? <laughs> I was like, and, you know, and, and just, I just, you know, that's a scientific method, right? I just started plugging something in. And then by the time I was 15, I actually had a paying job as the sound technician for the local planetarium. Nice. And, and, and what happened from there was all the other kids that either volunteered or worked there, they were 18, you know, 20, 21 years old, said, hey, man, we got a band. Can you record our band? Yeah, I'll record your band. And that's basically how I became a producer and a sound engineer. And, and by the time I was 19, I had, you know, a full professional studio in a building downtown and, and you know, out of my attic and all that kind of stuff. And then when I heard that very first garage band, come in and play an original song and admittedly you know looking back that the, the, the original song wasn't that great but at the, you know the time to a 15 16 year old kid you know this this group had, had written their own piece of music the other sort of light bulb went off in my head and i'm like ah okay i i can do that too and i have something to say and music's the way i'm going to say that music is the vehicle with which i'm going to tell my story and so that is how it all started i, I went from there I don't do things by half. I, you know, I either do it or don't. And so I, you know, started taking uh, classical guitar lessons when I was about 17, and then I went to school for music and, and did that. And now I'm happy to say I'm really honored that I'm a professor of uh, music technology at that same school where I went, you know, all those years ago. I, I'm, I'm teaching there now, which is a great joy for me. Um, so anyway, but that's kind of how you know I got started with music, and I've, I've done so. I kind of had the mentality of I don't. I'm not going to complain about something. Um, I'm going to I'm going to do something about it. I don't I don't believe in just like you know bitching and moaning about something mm-hmm. and then not doing anything about it. So I make I may bitch and moan, but I'm also going to do something about it. So um, I have done a lot of different things here in my hometown, um, you know, every from you know TV shows and whatever else uh, that I thought needed to be done for the music community. And so in 2006 they. Uh, honored me with the, this title of, uh, of the official music ambassador for Macon. So one of the things I do, um, and it, it's it's you know a largely honorary role, but it's um, it's something whenever I travel, um, I talk about Macon, Georgia, and the music that can, has come from this little small town in the middle of nowhere. I mean, we you know we're the home of Otis Redding, uh, the Almond Brothers, Little Richard. 
um, Wet Willie, all these wonderful, uh, you know, uh, Cindy Lanier, who's a classical composer and, and poet. Uh, more recently, you may remember the country star Jason Aldean from Macon, Georgia. So, you know, we, we have a lot of amazing talent in this area. And, you know, back in the late 60s, early 70s, you know, Macon was a real mecca for Southern rock and that sort of thing. And, and that genre has dried up to a certain degree. Um, but anyway, we, we talked about it, and I take I, – Macon is also the birthplace of the novelty instrument, the kazoo. Wow. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, I'm telling you. It's, 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 exactly. <laughs> so I'll, 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 Actually, I'll send you one, and you can annoy your friends and neighbors. But oh, I have the little – Okay. The official Joey, yeah, I have the official Joey Stuck kazoo, and I take them <laughs> all around. And, you know, uh, Gene Simmons has from Kiss has one of my kazoos. i got a great picture of him on my website playing the kazoo. Playing it the wrong way around, but that's okay. He's Gene Simmons. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a kazoo band one day. I think when we um, have you on as well, too, we're going to do, like, a kazoo concert or something. We'll have to come up with some songs. Yeah. Do not threaten me with a good time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, oh, it sounds like you're having a good time. <laughs> yeah. and, and, always, always. Oh, oh yeah, and and of course, uh, you had a lot of just influence as well too. I mean, Jeff Beck, Wes Montgomery, Mel Torme, Greg Allman, yeah. and um, who else is, is considered biggest influence uh, when it comes to like you know, your favorite artists, singers, and everything else? And I love old time radio. Talk more about that. Oh well, you know, I, I, I'm so inspired by everyone. You know, there's there's so many amazing art. I mean, I, mean, I am. Listen, I'm a Taylor Swift fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, my my bandmates mock me mercilessly about that. I don't care. She's amazing. Um, I love Dolly Parton. If you, I mean, to switch all the way around, uh, you want to switch around again. I love Pavarotti. Um, so if you, but but you know, influences as far as me, I I just I I hate putting music into a box. Now that being said, it's a necessary evil because one of the things you have to understand is. Who is it that's going to like my music, and how do I reach those people? And in marketing terms, we call that targeting your audience. Mm-hmm. So when you want to target, and this is for any business really, but when when you're when you got you got to figure out where it is your people hang out, um, and and how to reach them and, and and get them to basically support you to be patrons of your craft. And so um, you have to kind of put your music in some kind of box. But I I love everything from country to heavy metal. I mean, I, I just love good music. It doesn't matter to me what it really is. But influence wise, I mean, you know, I listen I love like on the guitar, I mean, uh we'll go a little further afield. Like I love like Adrian Ballou, uh who who you know played with Frank Zappa and King Crimson. Mm-hmm. Um I, I love uh Trevor Raven, you know, from the band Yes. Oh yes. Um yeah, so some, some great some great uh they also have some like Azus as well. They actually I gave this guy's they I, I gave it was it was Raven. Uh, Rick Waitman and John Anderson, and um, I gave them the kazoos. And when I got to meet them, and they uh, took them and played roundabout in three part harmony on these kazoos. Oh my I, goodness! I wish I, I had a recording you, of this or YouTube. I, I asked my wife. I said, "Did you get a picture of that?" She's like, "No." I, they said I had to put my phone away. I'm like, "Oh, I, I said, honey, I could have died happy. You could have, you could have literally bumped me off right then, and it'd been okay." <laughs> like, it, was, it was it was so cool but i mean you know i love i mean you listen to people like john mayer of course i mean john mayer's an incredible guitar player um you know eric clapton uh there's just i mean there's so many amazing but, but there's and you know the thing is i don't care if you've been playing for a year or you've been playing for 40 years there's something i can learn from just about anybody so i always keep an open mind and, and i always listen and uh, that honestly Unfortunately, with the kind of schedule I have, I don't really get a chance to practice like I'd like to. Um, so I practice mentally. Um, so if I'm listening to the radio, I'll I'll sit because you know I'm just I'm not allowed to drive. So I'll, I'll sit there and I'll dissect what's going on in my mind and break it apart theoretically. And it's almost as good as you know having the guitar in your hand. But I mean, maybe you know, the jazz world. I mean, I'm a huge huge John Coltrane fan. Uh, Miles Davis, John McLaughlin, uh, Pat Martino, Pat Metheny. Um, all these incredibly talented people, and and then you know, you, you, I actually got I got the chance to perform at the Georgia Music Hall of Fame Awards one year uh, when they inducted Little Jimmy Dempsey um, into the the Rock and Roll Hall of I mean into the Georgia Music Hall of Fame. Now he is someone you may not know, but he was a famous, famous, famous session player, and every major country album between the seventies and the nineties, probably he was playing guitar on it. Wow! And so I got a chance to. I was his proxy, his son, 
um, asked me to play to represent his dad when they inducted him to the Hall of Fame. And and I got to play, you know, some of his great, like, you, you may, like, there's a song called Help Me Make It Through the Night, mm-hmm. which is an old classic country tune. And he's on that. Um, just just all kinds of different um, uh, songs. And, uh, you know, you, you, you remember the, I don't know if you remember that old hit, I Never Promised You a Rose Garden. It was, I think it was Lynn Anderson was the name of the artist who sang it. Yeah, it but, was. You know, he played. Yeah, he played guitar on that. So, you know, I, I got a chance to do that and, and just discover some of his catalog. Um, you know, Chet Atkins is amazing, of course. Uh, Will Willie Nelson is pretty amazing. I mean, you know. Um, oh, yeah, I love uh, Willie. <laughs> yeah, how, how can you not? And and so, you know, I love all that stuff. And then, you know, like right now from, from a modern standpoint, this isn't really more guitar. This is actually more of a production thing. Uh, but from a producer standpoint, I am – just really loving songs by people like like Sean, you know Sean Mendez, like um, Sean Mendez, like uh, um, the song he's got "Senorita," mm-hmm. uh, which is a great track. Uh, and and that's that's from a production standpoint. I I get inspired by that. So I'm like ah, the EQ and the vocals was amazing. You know, it's just this sounds so great. And and wow, the way they've got that bass balanced out is just fantastic. And um, and what's really fun is I've I've made my wife and she she knew. You know, we're both uh, we were both kids in the 80s. Uh, so um, she you know, she knows every 80s song ever. Uh, and, um, and now I've ruined a few of those for her because <laughs> and it, 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 makes, it just I just laugh. I just makes me slap my laugh and smile because she uh, she'll hear a song and she'll go, oh, God, the snare drum is just too loud. in that song. I'm like, yes, it is. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's I mean, that's what I spend most of my day doing is making records for other people. So um, that's that's my real job as a producer for for other artists as I, I, um, I come in. That's that's you know mainly what I do. Uh, but I just I mean, man, I just love music. And I mean, uh, as far as the old time radio stuff goes, oh, my gosh. The, the BBC and the CBC have some of the best stuff out there in the universe. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of uh, Big Finish Productions, which is uh, – this is going to let my inner nerd flag uh, fly here. But, um, you know, they are, in my mind, the people that kept Doctor Who from dying. Oh, uh, really? But, yeah, I mean, I mean, Doctor Who, you know, uh, I, again, I was a very sick child. And one of the things my, my – par- my, I don't know how my parents did this. My parents um, had no – you know, they just – so God, all I can say is God just blessed them with the instincts to help a sick child, and um, they taught me little tricks um, to stay positive and to stay, you know, to stay uh, thinking about the good parts of life, not the bad parts of life. And I am not saying that you should not recognize when there's a problem, because that would be irrational and not healthy. Uh, if you if you were happy all the time, I would be concerned something was wrong with you. Um, so, so I'm not saying that it's okay to feel sad. That's fine, but it's it's not okay to stay that way. Mm-hmm. You know, you want to you want to you want to move. You express your frustration. Express that you don't like the way things are. That's perfectly normal. Now let's get back to living life. Mm-hmm. So, but they um they would they would teach me like how to like like set myself little treats like hey you know today's a bad day but just think on Saturday you could do X. Mm-hmm. Um, so like when I was when I was seven and it wasn't cool to know who Doctor Who was, uh, you know I was I was a huge fan of all the old shows and, and in fairness the new shows are better I, I I can't say they're not but but anyway um you know I would that was my favorite show and Doctor Who started in 1963 uh, and ran until around 1990 I don't know I think two or three and then it got canceled for a while and then of course it came back around 2004 I think it was and has is still going strong but. In the meantime, while it was off the air, um, this radio company called Big Finish actually hired all the all the old stars from the show and did radio dramas and it did a bunch of them and just kept. I think that's what helped you know helped keep the interest in the program alive. Uh, they've now done the same thing with some other classic science fiction shows uh, like Blake Seven, um, The Tomorrow People, um, and and uh, Torchwood stuff like that. So um, you know I'm a, I'm a huge modern radio fan and radio show fan as well. But but those classic shows were the were the real entree to me into a, a bigger world. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and and I you know I still I have, I do some sound design for for TV and film. Uh, I have a website that's just a bunch of sound effects. And my poor sweet wife she she doesn't think it's crazy at all for me to stand in the middle of New York City with a microphone on a street corner just catching like ambient traffic sounds mm-hmm. makes it perfectly reasonable. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think that's a great idea. You know, standing on the microphone all day, just catch ambient sounds. Yeah. You never know what unique comes out of it. You can go like, oh, you know, not just New York, fun. Chicago, Los Angeles, anyway. Miami, Dallas, yeah. Yeah. or, or well, we, I don't, I don't do it as much as I used to, but I, I 
used to always have a stereo uh, a set of microphones uh, and some kind of like portable recorder, either a mini disc or a DAT machine or something, uh, or a hard drive recorder or whatever. And I, I, I always had it in my bag when we traveled. If I heard something interesting, I'd stop and, and grab it. I actually have a 60-minute ocean surf CD called Hawaiian Ocean Surf that's that's out. Uh, that's just just me. Basically, when we were home, I was on tour in Hawaii for like 10 days. We had we were staying at the Kalamandra, which is a really nice hotel. It has its own private beach and everything. So I got my, my drinks tray, set my gear up on top of that, walked out about knee-high into the ocean, and just let the surf sort of break around me. Um, with this digital mic, and it, it's it's a really good recording. Um, if you've got Amazon uh, Unlimited Music, you can find it. Just say Joey Stuckey Hawaiian Ocean Surf, and it'll come up. Um, same thing, iTunes, you can buy or you can go to my website. There's a little website I have called 3daudioscapes.com where I just sort of stash stuff like that. And, you know, I may make four or five hundred dollars a year off it but yeah i mean that's that's fine i just i did it because i wanted to but i you know i do sound effects for theaters and uh local productions of plays and i've done a few few film and tv things but i it's, it's funny that i never really it, the, i got into the business to make to do sound design uh and it's funny that i really never have I, I that's always been a extremely narrow part of what i actually do but i love doing it and i love creating sound effects for i never forget i got hired to do some stuff for dracula and um, there was a local production of Dracula here in town, and and so I, I created all the bat bat flapping wings and all these. It was it's just a lot of fun. And then there was a Titanic, uh, which was a lot of fun. I got I had to figure out you know how do I how do I create this sound of the of the boat breaking up and hitting the iceberg and I, that it was just a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, the, the, the money wasn't really great, it, but I did it because I didn't really care about that. I just <laughs> I just wanted to do and, it. <laughs> and, and you're still and you're still saying up on top of the uh, the stern, I'm the king of the world. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, honestly, the thing is, man, I I really believe. I, I talk to my students now about. Um, I, I, I've always been rather verbose, um, but I talk to my students now on even more simple, complex, you know, simple uh, ideas. And the idea that I really have been hammering the last couple years is this idea of intention. And I really feel like um, if you have a center point that you start from. If you start from a point of intention, so if you say simple things like music makes me happy, and then you say, okay, now, if music is what really makes me happy, how do I make that my life so that I am, for all intents and purposes, happy? And so once you've made that simple decision, you have that simple intention to make music your life. And this, I mean, it could be anything. It could be music. For me, that's what it is. Um, then everything that happens from that moment on becomes a lot easier because you're not just reacting to what life does to you. You are planning for what you want to do. You're going out and making, creating things. So if you're constantly reacting to life without that core of intention, you're going to make some poor decisions because you're always going to be under the gun. You're always going to be making decisions at the last minute. And, and sometimes you make bad decisions when you do something like that. But if you come from a core of intention, whatever it is, doesn't matter what it is, um, and you're honest with yourself about what it is that makes you happy, now you've, you've got a powerful, a powerful roadmap to start moving your life in that direction. And so then what happens is it's all about knowing what it is that makes you happy and being honest about it. The fact is other people don't have to understand or agree. They don't have to, you know, it doesn't, it's about you. It's about what makes you happy. You, 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 sadly, a lot of people don't understand why, why would you want to play music for a living? That's not a real job. Well, it is a real job, and you can make good money at it. But you have to do things the right way, mm-hmm. and you have to be dedicated. Anything that you want in life, you have to dedicate yourself to. So, um, But I talk to my students about this idea of intention. And the thing is, I mean, my, my, for my students that I, take in, that I take under my wing that become interns and then even maybe later employees at the studio, um, you know, basically we have a couple of mantras. And one of them is, every day is a great day in the music business, even when it isn't. Yeah, and, that's a good one. Uh, I like that. Well, it's because we're doing what we want to do, right? How, how many people get to honestly say that they spend their entire day doing what they want to do? Does that mean that everybody you're going to work with is nice? No. Does it mean that everybody you work with is going to be rational? No. Does it mean you're going to get paid what you deserve or get the accolades you deserve? Maybe not. But the fact is you've made a decision about what it is you wanted, 
and you did that. And so, so, so to me, you just can't. Once you adopt that attitude, you just can't lose. Um, you know, every every day is a gift, and every day is a joy. And so, um, you know, and, and I have a very simple litmus test about. I, I think, um, okay, something bad happened to me today, and I say, okay, well, this upsets me. Um, but is it a brain tumor? No, it's not. Okay, we're good. Moving on. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I'm learning a lot from you, Joey. I'm learning a lot. I feel like we're in class right now. This is great. <laughs> well, like I said, I'll, I'll talk your ear off, man. That's <laughs> oh, that's oh, that's a good thing too. And um, also, do you have a guitar ready to go? I do. I always have a guitar ready. Fantastic. To go. Okay, I'll have you play a song or two, and in just a minute, first of all, you listen to the Mike Wagner Show at themikewagnershow dot com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios dot com for all you need. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today one eight hundred three zero three three nine six zero. That's one eight hundred three zero three three nine six zero. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios dot com. Mention Mike. Wagner Show, get 10% off your first order. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, the Mike Wagner Show can be heard on the themikewagnershow.com. You can check our Facebook page at facebook.com slash themikewagnershow. You can download and listen on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Also on Anchor FM, Radio Public, iTunes, Google Play, and Apple. Take the Mike Wagner Show with you on any mobile device and subscribe to the Mike Wagner Show on the YouTube channel. We're here a singer-songwriter, Joey Stuckey out of Macon, Georgia. He is the ambassador for Macon, Georgia, and also a music columnist, sound engineer, and uh, he's also a professor at Moore Mercer University. He's got uh, quite a number of songs out, and he's also got some albums. But first, he's got a guitar, and he's ready to go. And um, how would you like to play a little bit of uh, Blind Man Driving? Yeah, hey, no problem at all. I let me let me. I'm gonna set my phone down. We'll see how this works. Um, I'll set my phone down. Put on speakerphone. Let's see if that will will make it work for us better. So hang on, here we go. Okay, great. Here we go. Blind Man Driving by Joy Stuckey on the Mike Wagner okay. Show. All right, here we go. So here's. Uh, I'll give you the first. amazing and where can we find that on what album well that is off of uh six string soldier and um that that record came out 2016 there's a bunch of pretty good tunes on that record i've, I've kind of gotten back since since around 2016 i've kind of gotten back into doing eps and um and i and, and it, you know traditional ep is anywhere from four to six songs so uh i usually do about seven ish but I really, I really enjoyed. 2016 was a really weird year. Uh, my my sweet wife had to retire. She's a nurse midwife. She has an advanced practice uh, practice nurse um, with a master's degree in nursing, and then also a midwife um, that uh, she delivered babies, but she she could deliver them at home, but she prefers to live in the hospital because um, you know she could you can still do all kind of natural birth methods at the hospital, water births and stuff like that, and and still have the hospital there in case something goes wrong. Um, and the fact is her, her goal, she loves natural childbirth. She loves to do everything, you know, uh, the old fashioned way as best she can, but uh, she would rather be able to make sure there's a healthy baby, healthy mama um, and, and have all the modern tools available to her as well. But she had to retire from that uh, due to an autoimmune uh, 
uh, disease that sort of just snuck up on, uh, up on both of us and just kind of, you know, she didn't know she was sick. And all of a sudden, one day she was having, she just couldn't walk for a while. And uh, she's doing really great now. We she, she travels with me when we're on tour and we have a great time. But um, anyway, so 2016 was kind of a weird year. Um, my wife, I said that my dad had a heart attack. And um, so all these things. So I kind of slowed my schedule down a little bit. Um, stayed a little closer home to help out, you know, any way that I could. Uh, but in the meantime, um, they gave me a little, a little more time to write and a little more time to think about some stuff. And and uh, and I was like, you know, I've got all this tunes sitting around, and and the market is back, as I said, for EPs and and not full albums. And I thought, well, let's put this thing out. So that is the actual song, Blind Man Driving. Uh, was released uh, March of 2015 as a single, and the music video was released for it as well during that time. And the reason for that was I was uh, the keynote speaker at a conference at the University College of London uh, in the UK about um, you know blind musicians and uh, their stories and the, the you know adaptive technology, which I'm sort of a specialist in. Um, so I, I got a chance to sort of be the keynote uh, speaker for that, and and uh, and so we said, well, let's re- release the video. And the video, um, you know, I, I kind of uh, I've learned I learned who I am. I'm, I'm <laughs> at this point probably <laughs> not going to change. So initially, I had I had this all these ideas about the the, the this sort of loose. It, it was supposed to be a comical piece, um, even though the song's not really funny. But the but the video was supposed to be funny, and the idea was I'm trying to get to a gig. Like the, my ride didn't show up, and I'm trying to get to a gig, and I, I was going to have me like ride, driving a forklift and riding a horse and <laughs> rowing a boat, and, and then I was like, oh my god, we'll never get this done. This is too ambitious. So we cut it back. Um, and so it, it's basically it looks like if you ever seen the show Cops basically looks like an episode of cops it's it's got a very gifted friend of mine shooting the video with one camera but he literally is like hanging out of the back of a car uh with with one of our actual you know uh making georgia police department making pd actually chasing this this car around town they sent us a car and an officer and we filmed it and uh you know it, it was it was great it's a lot of fun and it, i encourage everybody to check out the video honestly the thing i'm more proud about on that song you know than the music the thing that's that the really excites me about that is the fact that there's a couple of scenes where I have to run down a street and some stuff like that. And I just knew I was going to bust my face. I just knew I was like, oh, I'm going to fall. But, but I, I was like, that's okay. I mean, I'll just get up again and I'll, I'll just, but I really, I mean, I didn't fall. I mean, it sounds simple, but for a blind guy, like running as fast as I'm able and opening a door and running through it all without stopping you know, was actually a big accomplishment for me. Mm-hmm. So, I, so for me, that's the cool part. <laughs> 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 that's a good song, but but the but the fun part is is the fact that I'm running down the street, and, you know, and it's just it's just it's a lot of fun. So, but anyway, that's a six string soldier record. And then, um, you know, I did uh, 2017. I and tw- I had uh, a single come out. Um, a dear, dear friend of mine that I met when I was uh, in the UK, uh, who was in a band called the Popes, and that band had ties to a band called the Pogues, who had several hits back in the '80s, "Dirty Old Town," and I remember like that. that. You're my London girl. That's one of my favorites too. It. Yeah, <laughs> you're my Jamie London Howard. girl. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So th- this, so these guys, the Popes, were a split-off group from the Pogues. And uh, and there was also a, 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 another guy in there that had, had played with the band Modern English, um, uh, played drums with the band Modern English. Had a song "Melt with You," mm-hmm. was their biggest hit. So anyway, he 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 came out to one of my shows. He was a friend of a friend of mine, and uh, who said, "You got to go see my friend. He's going to be playing in the UK." And he goes, and he walked up to his name was Charlie Hoskins, and he walked up to me and said, "Hey man, my name is Charlie Hoskins, and my superpower is I can sing like a girl." <laughs> and so we were instantly friends, of course. And and so the other thing about 2016 was Charlie and I got a chance to sit down and we've been wanting to write some music together because we just became instant friends, and um, so we've been wanting to write some songs. And so it's 2016, we got to write some songs. Together. And then in 2017, um, Charlie went in thinking he had a hernia, and turned out he had uh, cancer, mm. and um, so he passed away in 2017. And and uh, I'm so grateful I got to know him, you know, for the year and a half or so, or or two years that I did, and we wrote a whole record you know, together. And I, it hasn't, you know, I haven't put it out yet cause I haven't quite figured out, um, I hadn't quite figured out how to do it and how I want to 
to um, you know get it out there. But th- but the, but then uh, you know first part of this year, 2019, we released uh, an album called In the Shadow of the Sun, and that record um, was recorded in about three hours at Sun Studio, the famous uh, Memphis, Tennessee studio where Elvis and Roy Orbison, Johnny Cash did a lot of their recordings. And so we did the basic tracks there um, just for fun, really. And then because my, my trio was on tour, we had a day off. I said, I don't believe in days off. Let's go do something. Um, and so we, we – and then, and then we got our homes. Like, yeah, this is pretty good. And so I, I finished it up in my studio with – and I brought in a buddy of mine, Al Chez, who uh, the horn player, uh, trumpet player with Tower of Power, uh, and uh, he's an incredible trumpet player. Also played with the Late Show band for David Letterman for like 17 years. Wow! And, oh yeah, he was. If you if you ever listen to the old Late Show episodes, you you may notice like there's always this one super high trumpet that gets the last note almost every time when they come back for break. That's Al. Wow, that is <laughs> yeah. something. Kind of reminds me of the Doc Severinsen, uh, in a way, too, just hitting the high yeah, notes absolutely. and everything else. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, those guys those guys were some of the best of the best players. And so, Al, I met Al. It was weird. I, really, I met Al in, in early 2018 when I was in New York at the Grammys, and um, and we just became friends. And I somehow, before we left, I'd conned him into playing on my record. And so, um, <laughs> and so, and so then, so then, uh, and, and then I've got uh, like one of the songs you mentioned that you liked earlier today, uh, "Troubles Coming Threes. That's got legendary keyboard player uh, Randall Bramblin on the B3 organ. Now, Randall has written several songs that have been recorded by Bonnie Raitt, uh, but he's also played in uh, super groups um, like Traffic, uh, and he's played with Steve Winwood. Um, so he's been he's been part of Greg Almond and Friends. So he's you know he's he's a, also was in a band called Sea Level that uh, was pretty good pretty big in our area. I don't know how how big they were outside of of, of the South, but uh, anyway. But yeah, so Randall's on on this record, and and it's just a really special record. So we did a full record. We've been touring behind that record since March of this year. Wow. Uh, okay. And then, yeah, and then and then oddly, my agent called me uh, back around the end of July. And said, "Hey, do you have any Christmas music?" I was like, "Well, no." Um, so I was like, "Well, I've got a couple opportunities for some people need some Christmas music for some uh, film and TV placement." Um, and I said, "Well, I can get you some. I, mean, I have a studio that, that I can." <laughs> so I mean, okay, no problem there. And so I actually put out uh, a little Christmas EP. It's six tunes. Um, I wrote one of them. One of them I wrote, which is an original called "Santa That Plays Guitar," and the rest are. Uh, interpretations of classics like uh, "Let It Snow" and uh, you know "Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas" and "Jingle Bells," but um, it, it's it's a really fun funk blues you know um, interpretation of these you know classic Christmas carols. So that was released because uh, I, I, I'm a weird sense of humor. I released it on Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> Not surprising. And in yeah, fact, yeah, I've, I, I've heard of people that uh, record Christmas music around the Fourth of July. How do you like that? <laughs> oh well, listen, it's, it's crazy. I mean, well, you know, so I mean, it, it's the Christmas gets earlier and earlier every year, you know, and 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 especially with all the retail outlets, you have Black Friday, but now you have like pre-Black Friday sales and all this stuff. But yeah, we, you know, we um. We're, we're just now sort of starting to promote that record. And I have to say, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it, it, for some, I mean, I don't get me wrong. I like it. I like the record. I wouldn't have released it. But it's amazing to me how many people really love this album. Really? And what's, what is so, what's so fascinating about Christmas music, it only has a six week life every year, but every year it comes back. And, and every radio station, you know, wants Christmas music, and, and every uh, retail outlet wants Christmas music, and every every commercial, uh, Zales and, and different these different uh, commercials, they all have holiday music needs for their commercials, and so it's always it's always a good you know money maker um, once you get established with with your with your tracks. I mean, it's always a, it's always a good little source of revenue. So I, I've been wanting to do a Christmas album forever, but just never had the right. Uh, I just never had the right impetus to do it, and then my agent's like, "Hey, well, you can do this." And I was like, "Yeah, I can do it." So I got I got her the first three songs done in like two days. Wow! Uh, including right, well, I'm, I work pretty fast, so I, I included the song that I wrote, and then um, people loved all that stuff. Originally, I was just going to do it for um, film and TV placement, and then all these music supervisors like. This guy should do a Christmas album because I I want more of these songs. I'm like, okay, I, I I'm you know if the if that's what the universe says they want, that's what I'll provide. Mm-hmm. So um so I went ahead and did, you know, did like three more songs and knocked that out in a couple more days and it's it's just been a lot of fun. But mainly album if you want to check it out is 
is called A Santa That Plays Guitar. A Santa and, That Plays Guitar. And you know what, too? If it's okay, we can go ahead and play right now on the Mike Wagner Show. Santa That Plays Guitar. Looking absolutely. forward to it. Here we go. <laughs> Stucky, oh my favorite <laughs> Santa that plays guitar. Wow! <laughs> oh my silly. goodness! <laughs> oh, have some eggnog and dance with the reindeer, and don't forget Mrs. Claus. <laughs> That's right. And listen, uh, what happens during Christmas stays stays during Christmas. So if you if you get out there and cut the rug and act the fool, it's okay. It's Christmas time. Oh yeah, we'll definitely get that on for you as well too. <laughs> we'll talk about uh, your master classes, and if we have time, maybe a. Uh, a tune or two, you listen to the Mike Wagner Show at themikewagnershow.com, powered by SoundEquip Studios. Visit online at SoundEquipStudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. SoundEquip Studios is the answer. SoundEquip Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today, 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at SoundEquipStudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show. Get 10% off your first order. SoundEquip Studios. Take your image to the next level. Also, the Mike Wagner Show can be heard on the themikewagnershow.com. Check our Facebook page at facebook.com slash themikewagnershow. You can download and listen on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Also on Anchor FM, Radio Public, iTunes, Google Play, and Apple. Also coming on Stitcher as well, too, Podcast Addict, and more. Also take the Mike Wagner Show with you on any mobile device and subscribe to the Mike Wagner Show on the YouTube channel. We're here a singer-songwriter Joy Stuckey on Macon, Georgia, just having a fantastic Fantastic time with this legend, and he is so popular. He's been named the music ambassador for Macon, Georgia, his beautiful hometown. He's also a teacher at uh, Professor at Mercer University and also a sound engineer. And let's get to your um, master classes and something you've taken pride in. You talked about how you first got started recording and everything else. And tell everybody about your master classes, what they're about, and how can they enroll? Well, so basically, the. Um 
you know, when I was I, when I was in my early twenties, um, uh, people started asking me to teach, and I wouldn't. And the reason that I wouldn't was because I, I, I you know, as much as I joke and goof around and I and, and I have you know have a lot of fun, I do kind of take you know education seriously. And what I didn't want to do was I did not want to. Um, get out there and, 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 you know, not really seriously have something to say. And, um, you know, you know, everybody and their mama, you know, can, can uh, have their own YouTube channel and, and all that kind of stuff. And there's nothing wrong with it. That's totally fine. But I can't tell you how many students come to me, um, and say, Oh, I learned a new guitar chord over the weekend. I look, look, I know how to play F and I was like, well, that's actually a D. Uh, <laughs> it's like, you know, so I, I feel like one should, should, should be careful about, where they get their information. Um, and then, again, that's not to say the Internet's bad. I don't think it is. But I, I do think you should be, especially if it's uh, something that's going to be a career path for you. You know, college is not for everybody, and that's okay. But you need to make sure that you are taking in the information that's going to really put you on the right path. So um, I eventually did start teaching and stuff like that, and, and because I felt like I you know, had something to say and I had a certain skill set, uh, I was I an was advanced enough musician that I, I really had something to impart. So a couple of things that I talk about in my classes, and it depends on what, you know, they're, they're, they're by and large musically based, uh, but I'm really into body mechanics um, and I'm really into, you know, p- playing in, in ways that, that uh, are you know, good on your body, that, that put less wear and tear on your body. Um, and I, I have to be real conscious of that myself because of the health challenges I have. Uh, for example, you know, some of the great, guitar players uh, in the classical world, for example, Andre Segovia, uh, one of the greatest guitar players in the world, and, and, and um, uh, Charlie Parker on, on saxophone from the jazz world. You know, apocryphally, um, you know, I, I, you know, we, we have heard over the years that these greats would practice, you know, 16 hours a day, mm-hmm. um, se- seven days a week. That is just not healthy. Um, you know, it, it just isn't. I mean, if I did that, I'd just have carpal tunnel. Ooh, um, yeah. so, so, I mean, you know, so I I really believe in a different approach. I believe in um, very short, focused practice periods uh, with specific goals um, that are very concentrated. And I believe in doing those, like, five-minute practice periods, you know, three or four times a day. Um, and, and what happens when you do that? Is you build up your muscle memory, um, so you're actually getting a better workout and, for your brain and your body if you practice, you know, thirty to forty-five minutes a day. But you do it like practice five minutes, put the guitar down for a couple hours, pick it up, put it down, pick it up, put it down. That that actually is better for you long term. Um, so we talk about th- things like that, uh, vocal health, some things like that. Then, then there are the actual, you know, like like music business aspects that we talk about. Um, you know, how to how to have a career, how to market yourself, uh, how to have a business plan, how to incorporate so your assets are protected. Um, you know, all these different things that you really have to do if you want to be serious about being in, in the music business or, or any business. Um, and then some of the master classes move off into more esoteric places like um, how do you find your voice as an artist? Um, how do you come up with your unique sound? Um, th- you know, things like that. Uh, and then there's also uh, I, I teach the, a lot of improvisation classes like how do you become an improvisational player? Uh, that happens to be a real strength for me because what I, what I'm lacking in eyesight, um, I make up for in mental acuity. So, um, you know, I have a very good brain. I have a good, I have a good memory. I was a kid that everybody hated cause I made all A's and never really studied that hard. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, but, but, you know, but I mean, for the, re- but the reason for that was that I remembered what the professor said or the teacher said, and I understood it. And, uh, I, and that was that. So, um, that was, you know, it didn't require, you know, I've got friends of mine that are all A students too, but some of them had to spend, you know, every day studying like eight, eight, 10 hours a day. I just never had to do that. Um, and so, um, so I, I, so for me as a blind person, you know, at some point you have to come up with a sort of like, um, you know, effort versus rewards, uh, you know, table and you have to decide okay well you know i can do xyz but if i do that 
you know, what is that really costing me? So in my, in my case, for example, while I was trained as a classical guitar player, uh, I have turned my powers towards evil and now I play rock and jazz and all that kind of stuff. And I can still play classical, but the thing is, for me to, you know, if I if I was to get a gig playing a classical guitar with an orchestra, um, I'd probably make five hundred bucks for that for for the show and the rehearsal the night before. But but before I did that show, because I can't sight read the music, I'd have to memorize the music. So I'd probably have a good twenty hours worth of rehearsal that I'd have to put in to then then take the other rehearsal plus the concert there's another good 10 hours so 30 hours worth of work for 500 dollars. it's just not a good return on my investment mm-hmm. so what works better for me i mean i can do it um but it's just not it's just not worth the effort so what's better for me as a blind person is to play music like blues or jazz where improvisation is a highly prized skill and part of the experience and because I have a creative mind, and I don't, that means I don't have to read the page. Mm-hmm. So I can be spontaneous, which is one of my strengths. And also, um, it, it takes like basically no effort for me to do that at all. Uh, so, so that's the kind of things that we talk about in these master classes is finding out, you know, you be you. The thing is, you know, we've got, I love Kelly Clarkson, but we've already got one. We don't need another one. All right. Um, I, you know, I, I, I love, I love uh, Eric Clapton, but we've got one. We don't need another one. Come, come be you and figure out who that is and figure out what works for you. And there are, you may or may not sell out 80,000 seat arenas, but you can have a career that's worthwhile. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so those are the kind of things I talk about in the master classes. Then the other thing that I talk about, um, we, you know, I, do, I, do, I do some marketing stuff because I have what I call, four, there's four pillars uh, in my mind for marketing. Uh, and, and in this internet age, there's a lot of ways you can leverage what we call uh, direct to fan marketing to really understand what your fans want. You know, traditional um, thought was, okay, I've, I've spent five years and I've got 10,000 fans and I've got a new album now. Okay. All my 10,000 fans have just bought this record. So now what I've got to do is go out and get 10,000 more fans so I can sell those 10,000 fans, my record, Mm -hmm. but that's not really how it works anymore. What, what's actually better and it's a little counterintuitive, but it's actually better to go back to that first 10,000 fans again and say, okay, guys, you bought my current record. What do you want next? What is it you want from me? Hmm. You're, you're, you're a fan of my art. How would you like to consume that art? So it's actually easier to go back and get more money from the people that are your fans because growing your fan base is very hard and very expensive. Now, that's not to say – that you don't have to grow your fan base as well. You do because otherwise you'll stagnate and it, it just, it, you know, you have to keep you know, breaking into new markets and playing places you haven't played and all these kind of things to make new fans. But, you know, for example, um, if I was to discover there, there's, there's demographics, right? Which say uh, age, sex, income, uh, geographic location. But then we have things called psychographics, which are where, where else do my fans intersect with my brand? So if we if we find out, for example, that my brand, uh, most of my fans are, I'm a coffee drinker. I, I have to have my first, my one, I, don't, I, only, I usually just drink one cup of coffee a day, but I have to have my first cup of coffee in the morning. Um, and I'm a coffee drinker. I love coffee. So if we find out that most of my fans are also coffee drinkers, then we can say to them, hey, guys, would you like a new song um, for me to record a new song and release that? Or would you rather have a coffee mug with some of my lyrics on it? Mm, interesting. And, and, right? So you can literally ask your fans what they want. And if, if, if you ask them what they want and they tell you and you make that, then you're probably going to have a pretty good return on your money. Right, right now, the way we're doing things, I, I play shows. We, we, we never sell less than $200 worth of merch at a show. Never. And, and I'm talking venues that hold maybe sometimes you know 40 people. I'll still sell at least $200 worth of merch. Um, every time, and, and it, it's because because we've we've picked products that are universally appealing, and I've also worked hard to make them affordable. Like one of the things I did because I didn't want to spend a lot of money on t-shirts. Um, t-shirts are are one of the best things you can possibly make for for merch. But um, and I don't know if you've heard of the company called Merchly. They're part of Disc Makers, and they just featured me on their uh, blog, actually talking about this about merch, but. I, you know, 
the the traditional wisdom again in the '90s when I was really getting started was you take the album cover, slap it on a T-shirt, and there you go. But the problem with that is that one, sometimes album covers are great album covers, but don't make good T-shirts. Two, if you do a full color T-shirt that has you know seven or eight different colors in it. Um, it gets really expensive, and you can't really make a profit. So if you're spending twenty five bucks to make the shirt, you're not, you know, and you're not, you know, Paul McCartney or somebody, you're not going to get, you know, an independent artist is not going to get fifty, sixty dollars for a t-shirt. Mm-hmm. So, so you know, I can't, I'd have to sell them at cost. So I wasn't really making anything. So, um, you know, but so I said, well, we need t-shirts, but I don't want to spend that kind of money. I need to come up with a way to to have a solid color shirt. Doesn't really matter, it can be black or red or yellow or whatever, but to be able to have a one color print uh on on the shirt so that it keeps the cost down. Well, but I don't want to just put my name on it. That's boring. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean that's you know that's, who wants to just, you know, wear I mean, you know, so I thought about it and thought about it, thought about it. And I finally said, okay, I know what I want. I know what to do. So I came up with an avatar, and his name is Blink. Uh, Blink. He is a real person, so treat him with respect. Uh, so Blink is a stick figure uh, with a blind man's cane and sunglasses and a giant anime guitar that he's hauling around. And, <laughs> and he's just cool. hilarious. And so people, and so I wanted people to go, what the hell is that on your T-shirt? You know, I wanted to go. Why is there a blind stick figure on your T-shirt? <laughs> yeah. and, and, Blink. And so, you know, yeah. And so, they, and like people, I mean, seriously, people like, like do double takes. You know, like, what? Whoa, what is that? And you know, and so, and then of course it has my name on the bottom. But um, people adore this shirt, and you know, and I'm and because it's a one, he's just it's a black shirt with white, with white out with a white uh, stick figure, or you know, if we do red shirts or yellow shirts it's 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 black ink but regardless i mean that keeps the cost way down which means i can afford to sell those things and the thing is it's better for me to have people wearing my shirt and also uh, you know so i do i'll do a deal like a a, a bundles i'll be like hey one i'll I'll sell you one t-shirt for ten dollars or two for fifteen and you know people just you can't you can't pass it up and i'm so i'm still i'm still breaking even on my cost Plus, I'm making some money. Plus, there are people now walking around with my shirt on it, and and basically promoting me for free. Mm-hmm. So good it, advertising, a, yes. It's just a win-win situation. But what's what's changed, Mike? And this is what people need to understand. And it's weird. You know, you have to invest a lot of time understanding what's happening in your in your career and your market. You have to spend a lot of time reading and listening to articles and you know stuff like that, and going to conferences and stuff, so, so you can figure out what's going on. But what's really happened is the music has almost become secondary. Um, what's what's happening is that when people buy a T-shirt or a CD or some kind of merch like that, they're actually what they're really they're, what they're really buying from you is a memento of the time you spent together. So you have to these bands that aren't doing well with merch. There are three reasons why they're not doing well with merch. One, they haven't made merch that's compelling. Two, they don't have someone manning the merch booth during the whole time they're playing. You cannot just walk to your merch booth over there during your breaks. You cannot do that. You've got to have someone there the whole time because you've got to be able to take advantage of the impulse buy. When they, when you play a song and people are like, oh my god, that song's amazing, I, and then, then they want to go buy something, but there's nobody there, and then they may leave. And so you you can't you got and then three you got to put on a great show because if you're if you're putting on a great show and you've given someone a really memorable evening. Um, then, then they want to take home some some kind of souvenir, and the, the, and the reason that I say that the CDs and the T-shirts and we have a few other little things too, like buttons and stuff like that. But th- the reason they want to take that stuff home is it, 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 what they what they tend to think is, oh, I can buy their album on my phone anytime I want to, so they don't feel compelled to to do that right then. But if you don't leave them with an impression and you don't and they don't take home a little piece of their of, uh, a souvenir of their time with you they may forget they may listen they may buy jack white's new record instead of mine mm-hmm. right so so i mean you got it you got it you really got to strike while the on so anyway but, but those are the kind of things the master classes talk about is is those kind of things and then finally i do have a master class uh i guess you'd call it inspirational talk and it's it's um it's uh, it's living a successful life of intention as a brain tumor survivor and i have sort of po- four pillars um, and this this is appropriate for for high schools, um, civic groups, churches, whatever. Um, and it, it's just it just talks about 
um, my journey and some of the interesting things that's happened and, and the ways that I was going to learn how to deal with, uh, you know, things not being perfect uh, and still be happy and, and, and successful. And what, you know, to each person, success will mean something different. You know, to me, success is getting a chance to chat with people like yourself, meeting new and interesting people, uh, becoming friends, visiting, sharing my story, hearing your story. You know, that's what makes me happy. So obviously I got to make a living too, but you know, that's, those are the kind of things that we do with the master classes. So uh, a lot of them are, um, you know, for civic groups or, or high schools, uh, a lot of them are more college based. And of course I do private lessons and, and, and we're getting ready to break new ground on my, I've got a new studio complex that I'm bringing online. Um, probably mid-summer of 2020 and once that happens we'll be starting to hold actual conferences and and uh, master classes at that studio as well i did a few in my studio now uh, but uh, this studio is 9,000 square feet the new one 9,000 square feet uh on one floor and there are three floors of equal size so it's a huge space um so it, it, it's you know it's, it should be pretty exciting it is it is sounding exciting. And um, where can they find more information about master classes? Well, the best way to find it, <clears throat> pardon me, um, you can do one of two things. Um, probably the best way is to go to joeystuckey dot com, j o e y s t u c k e y dot com, and there's actually a tab. Um, if you, if you, there's a little drop down menu and it says master classes and it says booking. Um, so you can look at that there. There's also the fan zone, which we've worked really hard on to make, um, pretty exciting. And, and the fan zone will allow you to order CDs. We got vinyl, um, t-shirts, all that kind of good stuff. And there's a lot of free music for you too. So one of the things that I believe in from a marketing standpoint is let people that don't know who you are, take your music for a test drive. So we've got several ways for you to get free music. Um, and, and, and listen to it and, and see if it's something that you enjoy. Um, you know, what, the other thing is artists have to understand that much as, as uh, we would love for everyone to think that we're geniuses, sometimes our music's just not right for a certain – I mean, I think Garth Brooks is amazingly talented. I don't, I don't actually want to really hear him play, though. Mm-hmm. I just, you know, it, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't flip my switch, man. You know what I'm saying? I, I just, I think he's great. I, I respect him highly, but I just don't want to listen to it. It's just, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't make me excited. Um, but, but that doesn't mean it's bad. It just means that's just not what, what turns me on. So, you know, that, that you have to understand that your music may not be for everybody and that's perfectly okay. Mm-hmm. Nothing wrong with that at all. Um, so, but yeah, so, you know, but we, that's why we give people a way to sort of get a couple free songs and. And then if they like it, they can come back for some for, for some more. But uh, if you check out the fans on joeystuggy.com, that's another really great way uh, to, get, to engage with us. And, of course, we're on all the social media channels. I'm trying to stay young and hip. Uh, we're, we're on Twitter. We're on Spotify. We're on Facebook. We're on YouTube. We're on um, Instagram. I really don't understand uh, Snapchat. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it, 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 interestingly, it, it's, uh, it, it really appears to be – um, you know, something that even the really, really, either really, really young kids are doing. And of course now there's TikTok, and I haven't really gotten into that yet, but, uh, but you know, yeah, but, you know, drop by our, our social media. And the thing is, the best thing is, man, come out to a show. Cause, uh, we come early, we stay late, we shake hands and kiss babies. And, uh, we, we really, and truly, uh, whether it's just me and the guitar and my lovely wife selling the merch and, and collecting the money to, to pay the rent or whether it's me and the band we really do take a great joy in meeting everybody and and visiting with everybody and and you know and just and just connecting as human beings that's that's what i mean i think our technology today is really wonderful and as a blind person uh but some of the technology we have available on the iphone it has really helped me out in so many ways it, um you know being able, you'll be able to send text messages and my, my phone talks to me and reads back text messages and reads back emails but but we also have found on a real disconnect, uh, the technology that's supposed to bring us closer has actually done the opposite. Mm-hmm. So we we do take some joy. Well, again, I love the technology, and I'm not I'm not blaming it. I'm not a luddite, uh, but I do I do think that it's really important for human beings to connect with each other on a human one to one or 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 you know just a, just a human level um, because that is really. I think fuel for the soul and fuel for the mind. And, and that's just really important. So, you know, that's another way, you know, come out, meet us, say hello, 
we'll 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 sit down and chat with you and as long as we can until until our rotator says get on the bus and get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> and, and of course, speaking speaking of going on tour, um, what are your what are your upcoming plans for uh, twenty twenty when it comes to a tour? Well, yeah, so God, so this is, so since March, man, we've been uh, New York, we've been New Jersey, L A, Detroit, Chicago, uh, North and South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, uh, Tennessee. Um, pardon me if I'm forgetting. I'm, I'm sure I'm forgetting some places because I've I've, <laughs> I've slept since then. But um, <laughs> we're starting to wind wind down right now. We've got a gig coming up in South Carolina. Uh, I've got a gig coming up in North Atlanta. That will be probably, and then I've got another gig here in Macon. Those will be our last three shows of the year, and those take place on like the 30th of November, I think the 12th of December, and the 21st of December. But then, uh, so we're gonna have a couple weeks off. And then I will be in L.A. Um, on January 3rd to play the famous Whiskey A Go-Go on the Sunset Strip. Nice. So we're, we're very excited about that. And, um, and so um, that's, that's pretty exciting. And then come the end of January, I'll be back in L.A. for Grammy Week and uh, performing, um, doing some stuff there. There's a, there's a party there every year that's pretty massive called the Soiree. And uh, we'll be performing there this year as well. So those are the two big things starting starting for next year. And and we'll be we'll be um, you know the first part of the year, the first three months of the year will mostly be me doing solo stuff um, because of um, we're all, all the guys in the band uh, are we teach we all teach. Um, and so um, but during the summer of 2020, we'll be on the road quite a bit, and we're looking forward to uh, we're booking festivals and a bunch of stuff like that. And then again. As I said earlier, I'm also the other project I have is I teach for two different universities here in town, but I also um, am putting this new studio online. So as I as that comes online, that will require some time too. But we'll be out playing a lot. We can't we we you know we don't we don't we don't tour 365 days of the year, but at the same time, uh, we don't like to not be active. Um, and I've got several universities that want me to come up and spend some time with them, um, doing some master classes and stuff. One's in Connecticut, one's in Iowa. Um, during spring sort of marchish so i'll be we'll, we'll be around we'll be with we'll, and 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 the, the joeystucky.com website's an awesome way to sort of um you know find out what's going on we we usually get new gigs up on there within you know 24 hours of of them being booked and confirmed and we also have a little bands in town tracker you can you can uh, click on and subscribe to that helps like helps you know if we're coming to your area. That is fantastic, and uh, of course, you know, just a few um, minutes here as well too, and maybe you can uh, play another uh, song for us as well too. What's considered most defining moment? <sighs> wow. Well, you know, my most defining moment. Um, I uh, late a latent issue from the brain tumor. Um, was that I ended up losing a, a hip. I uh, had a, 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 so I have a metal hip on my right side, and I, I I was misdiagnosed for about a year. They thought I had bursitis, and then one day I just couldn't walk anymore, and I spent about eight months in a wheelchair. Um, and all my dates are blind dates, okay, ha ha. But, <laughs> but, but <laughs> this particular this particular date was a real blind date. A friend of mine set me up. Uh, on a date and I'd never done that before and I honestly I was like man I'm blind I'm in a wheelchair and I'm a musician three strikes and you're out this is never going to work and uh, I was like I, I don't is it really the right time to go meet somebody new when I'm not at my best you know and uh, and then the other part of my nature said ah oh, what's the worst that can happen and so I ended up going on the date and that was my sweet wife Jennifer wow. and uh, and we like so we've been married 16 years now and we actually got to celebrate our anniversary while we were on tour in New York happy anniversary uh, yeah thanks man it was awesome we had we had such a good time we always do we have a good time wherever we go but we you know that that moment uh, I I really was one of the lowest moments I'd had you know physically and I was real concerned about um, you know, being accepted and, 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 you know, thinking, well, God, this guy's, you know, got so many problems. Or is this somebody I want to be, you know, be with and, and all that kind of stuff. But, but honestly, I met her, um, in, in July, actually July 17th. Um, and by October 10th, I had proposed and, uh, and she accepted. And then by June 21st of next year, we got married. And I, I also met her when, 
I was directing. I've been hired to direct a musical at one of the colleges here, and I was directing the Rocky Horror Show. Wow, and, uh, I love yeah, that. So, oh, me too. So our our early courtship was her taking me to play practice and wheeling me in doing the wheelchair and sitting there watching me to you know practice this musical. And uh, so you know, it just it just that that moment of you know. As long as I keep my faith in 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 in, in the ability for the human spirit, you know, it, it's 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 faith in me, yes, but it's faith in mankind, really. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it is faith that that mankind is so resilient, and, and and we can really do anything that we set our mind to. I mean, there are tragedies, of course. There are sad things. There are things that make you mad, but overall the overarching story that's not the story um and and you and you look at i I say you know i i ask my students um every every semester when i start teaching class first thing i ask was okay how many star wars fans we got in the in the uh you know in the the, class and like those of you that are not star wars fans you're dead to me get out Um, (laughs) and uh but no but i mean but i I think and i i admit that it's cheesy but i but i believe it's true as well you know there's a wonderful line in empire strikes back when Yoda's talking to Luke. And and the line is, luminous beings are we, not this crude matter. And that really is something that I felt like came home to me during that time. I was in my late twenties, it's like twenty eight years old. And and it just helped me realize like, you know, this this the body that I have here does not work as well as I would like, but it is not me. It is it is it is a part of me, yes. But it's not the whole story. Um, the spirit that informs this body is much more important. And um, and so I, I, that that to me was just a real defining moment to realize that you know I always wanted to be married. I always wanted to find a best friend to share my life with. Um, you know I, I wanted to do music full time, and I was able to do all those things despite all the things life was throwing at me to try and stop me. Um, not be able to walk for a while. Um, all these different things. And and last year at the Grammys when I was in New York, my right shoulder started hurting. Ooh. And uh, I thought, oh, I just picked up my guitar weird or picked up a bag weird or something like that. Um, and so come to find out, um, I had to have a complete shoulder replacement. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, so about two weeks ago, I had my one-year shoulder replacement um, uh, visit. You know, I had, so it's been like a year since I had my shoulder replacement. Um, and that was, I mean, that was not as much fun as I'd hoped. I gotta admit it was, it was pretty rough. And, and, and you know, for six, six to eight weeks, I couldn't move my right arm at all. Mm. Uh, and, then, and then there were some other, there were some other things that happened during that time uh, that, that, that was just the hospital not doing the job they should have done. Um, and, uh, making things really hard on me. And then there, there were moments I thought, my God, am I going to, am I actually going to live through this? But um, my, my arm, my doctor was like so impressed. I went to see him, like I said, two weeks ago. And they, I said, look, I'm not going to have parity with this right arm. I want to parity for those who aren't you know, thinking about medical terms, basically just meaning, can, will, will my right arm be able to do all the things my left arm can do? Can my, will my non, will my surgical arm be able to do all the things my non-surgical arm will do? And they're like, well, probably not. I was like, well, that's not acceptable. So I'm going to, I'm going to say that I'm going to say that I'm going to get parody. Mm-hmm. So I got there. I was like, Hey doc, check it out. I got parody. And he was like, Oh my God, I can't believe you could do that. And so he was like, so he was just so you know psyched and, and excited. And, and uh, so, so the point is, you know, I, I, I think about these things, you know, I, the, the brain tumor I had, it's not totally uncommon to lose one joint, but it's really uncommon to have, issues from that make you lose more than one joint. Uh, but I would I like to call it one percenter. So uh, you know, <laughs> if it's going to happen, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen to me. But, but you know, I, I just – that's what I want people to, to, to think about. Like it, it's not – being inspirational is not to say that life is sometimes hard, not to say that life's not even unfair sometimes. Um, to acknowledge those things are important because if, if you don't acknowledge the pain, you don't acknowledge the, the, the things that frustrate you, then you can't live an honest and, and healthy life. But but you also have to move past that point and realize that when you reach deep down and you, you find that core of strength that can help you catapult yourself across or through or under the trouble that you're being assailed with, you know, you do have it within you 
to be successful and to defeat um, anything that's trying to, 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 to knock you off course. Now, you may have to do things a little differently. You may have to approach something in a different way than somebody else uh, has to approach it, but that is okay. And I think the glory of being alive is the diversity of man and how incredible it is. It's like, you know, there's 15 different ways to do the same thing. And, you know, it, it's, it's just it's amazing how people find so many ways to overcome obstacles. Um, so it, it's just, it's look, you know, be, say to yourself, okay, you know, but boy, not being able to see sometimes is a real pain in the butt. That's that's perfectly reasonable. Um, what's not reasonable goes, I can't see, therefore I'm angry at the world, and I'm going to have a miserable life. That's mm-hmm. not reasonable, right? So those, 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 they're, they're pretty easy contrasts to spot. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so I mean, you know, that, but that, that was the moment for me that, that, because I honestly, as much as I hate that hip surgery and that whole experience was really hard, um, I, I wouldn't trade it because it's, I mean, it's when I met my wife. So we're all good, man. As far as I'm concerned, that's a fair trade. <laughs> that, that sounds like it. That is fantastic. And uh, who do you consider your biggest influence in a career? Well, I mean, so many people. I've, I've been so blessed to meet some of my heroes. Um, I've, I've had a chance to work with Alan Parsons, who's a, a, a dear friend. Uh, I've, I've just recently met another one of my heroes, uh, Ron St. Germain, who's become a dear friend. Um, and, and, you know, just so many wonderful, talented people that, that I've been surrounded by. Uh, but, you know, I mean, Gosh, I, man, I love. I'm right now. I'm reading uh, I, I, audio books. I read is what I read most. I do. I can read Braille, but I'm not. I'm not super good at it. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, and the reason for that is it, it. It just wasn't something that was available to me as a kid. Um, and, you know, and so I just. I just. Never, I didn't learn it. You know, early on. Uh, but um, I, I mean, like, man, Billy Idol's incredible. I'm reading his book right now, which is called uh, Dancing with Myself. It's really. It's really. Uh, a good read, Ooh, nice. and if you if you can get the audiobook, he actually reads it. He uh, does. Wow, with a rebel oh, yell, I bet. <laughs> oh my god, dude, rebel yell, man, it's so good. I mean, it's just so interesting to him read it. Um, yeah, so it's really it's really crazy. So I mean, I, I love I love Billy Idol. Uh, I'm a huge huge fan of like Crowded House and Neil Finn. Um, you know, I, I'm Paul McCartney. I mean, you know, somebody asked me that. Who I said, well, if you're forcing me to pick just one influence, which is unfair, but if you're, if you're forcing me to pick just one, I have to say it has to be the Beatles. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how anyone in music cannot have the Beatles at least somewhere in their DNA. Mm-hmm. Um, they were just so revolutionary. Of course, I mean, the Who, the Kinks, Hendrix. Of course, I mean, Hendrix, for a rock guitar player, a blues guitar player, you know, you got to love I mean, Hendrix is, is, you know, Van Halen. Um you know, uh, John Petrucci. Uh, but I mean, it's so hard because I mean, there's so much good stuff out there. Um, but uh, it, it's it's so hard to pick, you know, just one. But man, but you know, but but, but I mean, I, I draw a little bit from everybody. I mean, you know, and and uh, I just I love it. But again, I mean, you know, it, it, it's cliche, but you know, you have like I said for for blues and stuff like that. I mean, you'd have to have Eric Clapton in there. You'd have to have Hendrix in there because you know, music is a language. And they creative they they created a real distinct uh, vocabulary, and so um, you can't really play rock or blues without learning their their vocabulary first. And once you once you have that down, then you can start contributing your own vocabulary. Uh, but you have to learn the language from the masters first. So and the same thing with jazz. I mean, you can't. There's just no way you can not be influenced by by Miles Davis or Train or you know or or Sonny Rollins or or some of those guys. Um, Oscar Peterson, one of my favorites. Um, uh, Dave Brubeck, you know. So I mean, th- those guys are just you know so so critical to to that genre that you've got to dig them. You know, you've got to dig them up with some. You've got you've got to have them in your DNA. Mm-hmm. So I mean, but so I mean, but I, I mean. I just I love so. I mean, you, you, Mike. It would it would horrify you to see my my room. It is stacked floor to ceilings with 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 albums and books and just. I mean, you wouldn't believe the catalog of music. I mean, you know, I'm I'm a Georgia boy, so I gotta love REM. Uh, oh you know, yes, <laughs> you, you know. So I mean, I've, I've actually recorded with Mike Mills a couple times, uh, who's the bass player from that band. Um, so you know, I mean, um, just so many wonderful. Uh, groups and and just there's so much incredible music out there. I'm always excited to find out you know to find out new stuff. I mean, there's um you know the '90s had a lot of. I mean, Nirvana. I have to say that that from a 
sonic perspective. Uh, Nirvana, uh, Nevermind album was a really pivotal record for me. Uh, Butch Vig, of course, the producer for that record, which I had the honor to meet um, a couple of years ago. Uh, but you know, it, it's 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 just really a um, it's just really an incredible. It's just just really incredible how many amazing albums there are out there. But the, but 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 for if you're a drummer. It, you, you gotta love Nirvana's albums because the drum sounds of that. You know, Dave is pretty much D- Dave is pretty much uh, Dave Grohl is pretty much the uh, John Bonham of our generation. So mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I could see that, or uh, Keith Moon or uh, Chester oh, Thompson from Genesis and all that. You know, oh my gosh. Okay. As, well, and Phil Collins. I mean, uh, Phil Collins is so amazing. It's so many. Oh, I, I mean, he uh, he's so multi. Uh, generational talent is like throw an instrument he'll probably be like he'll require like you know an octopus to do that like octopus arms oh my gosh oh yeah oh and of course neil pert from rush i mean oh definitely know. yes oh my gosh I, I, wow I'm, I'm frustrated i'm, I'm a guitar i mean I, I play drums at a at a low side of adequate uh level um but but you know i mean guitar bass and vocals are my three big ones and i play keyboard at a low side of adequate level but i mean i was a frustrated drummer in college i, I minored in percussion because i was like well you know i already play guitar and and, and uh I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of set there. So I'm getting basically I'm getting paid to play guitar. So we're going to leave that alone. But I'll, <laughs> I, was like, I took percussion in, in college, and, and I mean, it was a lot of fun. But man, I mean, the, the stuff those guys do, and you know, the people like uh, my point noise from like Dream Theater, and uh, I mean, there, uh, there's so many of me. I just you know, of course, and we recently, you know, we just lost one of the greats, Ginger Baker. Oh yes, he was the one that. Um took uh art drumming to a whole new level oh my Incredible. goodness yes Incredible. wow not not a man that you'd want to make unhappy that apparently he, he punched you for a little for not too much <laughs> 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 but, but no, i mean he, he uh he really i mean he just his drumming was just really incredible to me and and, and um and I, I those records are just the, the cream records there's only four of them i think but they're Man, they're really just those are albums that if you don't have them, you they, they need to be in every music fan's collection. Mm-hmm. Um, and then of course I go, you know, um, I go to um, the early '90s. Uh, it was really formative for me musically, so I was listening to things like Robin Hitchcock and um, the Smiths, and um, you know the Lemonheads, and uh, bands like Dada, and uh, all, you know, all, all these wonderful, you know, Dylan Fence, and, and all these great. Um, you know, these great sort of you know, Matthew Sweets, you know, one of my favorites. Um, so, I mean, just there's so many amazing people. You know, Amy Mann's one. I'm a huge Amy Mann fan. Um, uh, so I just think that there's, there's, there's so much incredible music out there. And, and, um, and, and you know, and but but there's but there's room for more. So mm. you know, and, and don't forget the listen? Smashing Pumpkins out of Chicago, where I grew up. Smashing oh, well, Pumpkins, listen, and, yes. And, and you know, that's interesting you mentioned them because I actually have a, a, a sort of a weird tie to them. So they recorded. I know their first two albums they recorded in Georgia. Wow. Uh, at, a, at a studio called Cyclops, and um, that was the Gish record and the Siamese Dream record. And a buddy of mine who actually played on my first album, his name is David Ragsdale. He was the uh, he was not the original member, but he was a touring member with the band Kansas on electric violin. And all the strings you hear on the Smashing Pumpkins records, uh, that's David Ragsdale. Really um, amazing, yeah. and yeah, so David, that's David one of my favorites out. too. With strings, that's amazing. Yeah, so on that song, Disarm, um, and what else? Uh, tonight, and tonight is one of my favorites. Yes, yeah. So David, that's David playing strings on that. And if you go to my very first album, which is called Take a Walk of the Shadows, um, there's a song on there called Hate You. It's a very cheerful song, uh, and he's playing uh, electric violin on that. And then I've got another song called Mister Destruction on that record where he's playing violin. And then uh, on that same record, there's a song called uh, My Sociology, which is where he's playing violin. So he, I grabbed him, and we became friends because he's a Georgia boy. He's from, um, I, I think, Columbus, Georgia. Uh, so, so, yeah, David, I, I've kinda, we've kind of lost touch over the years, but um, uh, you know, he, that's kind of my, my weird tie to the Smashing Pumpkins. That is something, too. And, of course, uh, the best advice you can give to anybody at this point? <laughs> You know, I mean, it's basically twofold. Uh, know what you want and be willing to, to, to do what it takes to get there. And the second thing is understand that nothing's for free and you have to work hard to do it. So my my request or my for people is basically this. It's like, okay, if you want to be in the music business, that's fine. 
you, you may have to keep your day job for a little while. That's okay. What you need to do is come up with a three-month, a six-month, and a 12-month business plan. You need to come up with a steady amount of money that you can spend on your career. It doesn't matter if it's 50 bucks a month, whatever it is. And you need to come up with a steady amount of time that you're going to spend in your career. That time can be calling, calling local restaurants to book a gig. That time can be practicing your instrument. That time can be rehearsing. That time can be recording. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. But you, you allocate those things, and you stick to it no matter what happens. And if you say, well, gosh, you know, I've got 50 months I can spend, 50, $50 I can spend this month, but I really need to spend $150 to buy a, a cheap digital recorder so that I can record some, start recording my band practices. Okay, we'll save up for three months and then buy that. But but just 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 find what is within your means to, to do and just stay with it, stay with it, stay with it, stay with it. And what you'll find is that slowly you'll be able to start transitioning more and more of your time into what it is you want to do. So right now if you're working at a gas station or you're working as a server at a restaurant or um, or, or, or you know, you're washing cars, that's great, man. Make, make the money. Keep food on the table. Take care of yourself. Take care of your family. But over time, if you really want to be in music business full time or whatever it is, I mean, if you want to be, I don't know, if you want to be a trapeze artist, it doesn't matter to me, you know, whatever makes you happy. But just, you just know that if you come up with a plan and you stick to it, you'll eventually be able to put more and more resources behind what it is you really want to do. And within three, five, three, three, three to five years, you'll, you'll be able to transfer over full time to what your passion is. And, and, and that's really going to make you happier. And, and it's going to help you to inspire people around you to be happy. So that, that's my thought. I mean, and, and the other thing is, you know, the, the reason I say it's important to write this stuff down, some of this stuff seems real obvious. Like Joey, I don't need to write that down. That's stupid. I know that, but it really helps you to be able to look back at where you have come from and go, gosh, man, when I started six months ago, I never thought I'd be able to accomplish X. And here I am, you know, six months down the road, I've done that. And I, I, I just can't believe I was able to do that. So it will give you a track record of your successes. It will give you a track record of your failures. Now the failures are not things to be afraid of. It just simply is, okay, I tried X, Y, Z, and that didn't work very well, so I won't do that again. I will try something else. I will try ABC this time instead. And you go, oh, that worked great. I will do that again. So you just, you know, you, it, it, that, that's the way to do it. Uh, and I, I just think that, um, you know, anything that you want is, is, is – within your reach if you are if you really want to dedicate yourself to it. Mm -hmm. That is fantastic advice. And um, Joey just wants to say a big thank you for your time. You've been fantastic. Definitely have you got in 2020. And by the way, uh, would you like to uh, play quickly just uh, one more quick song before we go, like Trouble Comes in Threes or whatever you'd like to play? Yeah, so, so are, you, are you saying, like, are you going to play the, uh, the album track? Um, let's see. We can probably do that. Let me uh, take a look here. And, of course, you know, as we mentioned, listen to the Mike Wagner Show at themikewagnershow.com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. And Troubles Comes in Threes. And here we go. We'll go ahead and play the track. Trouble Comes in Threes on the Mike Wagner Show to wrap it up with Joey Stuckey. Thanks, guys.
Classic. Joey Stuckey. Toa comes in threes on Mike Wagner's show. Joey, a big thank you for your time. You've been fantastic. Definitely have you again in 2020. And whoops, no encore. Yeah, we'll save it for next time. Again, it tells you about coming projects, website, how do people contact you, where to purchase and listen to your music. Absolutely. Best place to go is joeystuckey.com. And uh, or hit us up on social media. Uh, it's just uh, at J Stuckey Music on Twitter and Instagram, and then of course uh, uh, Facebook dot com slash Joey Stuckey. And uh, again, Joey Stuckey dot com. It has been a true privilege and pleasure, my friend. Thank you, sir. And thank you, Joey, as well too. You've been fantastic. Looking forward to having you again soon. Definitely have you on for twenty twenty, and uh, keep us up to date. I love to have you back on again. And uh, hey, with, all you got to do is say the word. Sounds good. And with the kazoos this time. <laughs> I will, yeah, hey, I, I'll, I'll say, shoot me your, your address and I will mail you the official Joey Stucky kazoo. Thanks for listening to the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. The Mike Wagner Show can be heard on Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, iTunes, YouTube, Anchor FM, Radio Public, and the themikewagnershow.com. Please support our program with your donations at themikewagnershow.com. Join us again next time for another great episode of The Mike Wagner Show. 